Welcome to the Center for Biosecurity Studies webinar in celebration of World Wildlife Day 2023. On behalf of the principal of the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill Campus, the advisory committee and the team, I, Janice Brown, clerical officer at the Center for Biosecurity Studies, especially welcome Dr. Mark Gibson, our expert, presenter, our local press, those of you who were joining us for the first time and those who would have joined before. And whether you're from here in Barbados, the region or international, we welcome all of you to the Center for Biosecurity World Wildlife Day webinar. The Center for Biosecurity is the sole entity at the University of the West Indies and within the entire Caribbean explicitly devoted to biosecurity, which we define as the science and practice of safeguarding lives and livelihoods, which yield a unique perspective on the importance to national and regional sustainable development efforts. The mission of the center is to support these efforts to assess, prevent, mitigate where possible, and respond to any threat that could potentially destabilize Caribbean society. World Wildlife Day was celebrated on Friday, the 3rd of March. And so in keeping with this celebration, the center will look closely at the biosecurity threat with reference to wildlife, pet, and aquaria trade. Dr. Kurt Douglas, the director for the Center for Biosecurity Studies, will give you an introduction to this exciting webinar. I will also introduce you to our expert presenter, Dr. Mark Gibson, who is the director of Nurture Nature in Trinidad and Tobago. Doctor. Douglas, your audience. Thank you so very much, Janice. And a warm welcome to all of you in the audience uh, who have joined us as the center looks to celebrate World Wildlife Day 2023. And for those of you who may not have um, been privy to our previous webinars, um, the center has an initiative. It's called the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. And this was launched in 2021. Um, and what we've done since then is try to look at how we can um, update you on this particular initiative. Um, so there are a number of activities that were done. And part of me, I'm trying to see if I can actually present my screen. If Zoom will allow me to. Sorry, All right here we go. Yes. So this was the wildlife initiative. Uh, I'm just going to provide a very brief update to kind of set the context around what Dr. Gibson will be sharing with us later. Um, it will be short, so no worries. The this or these are rather the aims or goals and objectives to improve the relationship between Caribbean people and Caribbean wildlife. We conducted uh, are in the process of conducting a legislative review of Caribbean wildlife law and legislation um, so that we can identify gaps and also develop much more well suited legislation. Um, that would curb any deficiencies that currently do exist that can then um, engender a lot of the criminal activity or the deleterious impacts to Caribbean biodiversity. A fun fact is that the Caribbean and Latin America regions, this, those two regions are actually the most diverse as it relates to biodiversity in the entire world. So we have within our care the most diverse biodiversity in the entire world. And we have to shape the necessary systems to protect them. Um, we would have heard of COP15 just last year, I believe it was, and that COP was related to the COP15 
26, 27 climate COP, but it specifically looked at the impact of climate change on uh, biodiversity and the, the, the rate of biodiversity decline um, across the world. And so these are the objectives related to this particular initiative. There were a number of policies, sorry, which we just briefly mentioned here, CITES, SPA, the rule of law, the Bridgestone Declaration, obviously named after the meeting here in Barbados that was held virtually during the pandemic, obviously the Paris Accord. Then these are some of the challenges that face uh, wildlife and biodiversity within the Caribbean. Uh, some of the threats are the, the fragmentation due to the expansion of agriculture, um, cities, the, the urban development, tourism, obviously, as you develop the coastal areas, and then commercial development as well. And so as we look to develop sustainably across the Caribbean, these are things that we have to be very mindful of. Remember, what is in our care is the most diverse biodiversity in the entire world. And we've done some of these activities as wildlife legislation. This was done with UNODC and CITES, and we want to pick this back up this year, along with OECS. We're going to target that region, and we want to have a legislative review and also legal workshop where we're training those persons who draft the legislation within the OECS to be able to frame the requisite um, legal framework to protect wildlife and also to engender a much more positive relationship between humans and wildlife. Um, and there's also the, 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 the Caribbean Wildlife Database, which CARICOM Impacts is also assisting us with. This is just showing you a graphic of the illegal wildlife trade of wild birds. This is something that is uh, prevalent within the region. Many people may or may not know about it, but um, Dr. Gibson will definitely go into this in more detail. This shows you just a few pictures of what the smuggling looks like. Um, this was at JFK Airport in New York. Then this is the Caribbean Wildlife Crime Database, the concept that we are looking from forest to courtroom because we have to build that chain of evidence and then along with the legislation so that we're able to STEMI and to prevent this type of uh, illegal wildlife trade and damage to the biodiversity within the region. Um, these are some of the needs of that database. These are some of the events that were held. This was back in uh, 2021. This was the World Wildlife Day message. Um, this is the cover of the legislative checklist, which we did in tandem with CITES and UNODC. And this was the last event that uh, was a part of the Caribbean Wildlife Initiative. And this was just a few days ago where we turned our attention to bird flu, this threat to wildlife, because bird flu is definitely a threat to the wild birds within um, the Caribbean and possibly also some mammals as well, if it does enter and does spread. And this was um, really a very encouraging webinar. Um, we had a lot of engagement, not only from within the region, but also externally. We have persons from Africa, Asia, North America, Europe, all tuning in uh, to hear from these four uh, gentlemen who provided some really keen insights into the current state of bird flu within the global context and also the threat that is posed to the Caribbean. And now we turn our attention to the next event that we have that is framing this whole conversation around wildlife, around biodiversity within the Caribbean and also the pet and aquarium trade, something that most persons may not be very um, keenly aware of in terms of not only the threats they pose, but also how easy it, is, easy it is for these animals to become really, really bad threats to agriculture, to human health, and such the like. So Dr. Mark Gibson, he will be able to give us more context on that. And at this stage, then I will stop after I've given you that context and hopefully you followed. And I will now introduce Dr. Mark Gibson, and uh, he is the director of the Nurture Nature 
campaign, a coalition-based wildlife trade project in Trinidad and Tobago. And he completed his PhD at Michigan State University, the School of Criminal Justice in 2022. So we must congratulate Dr. Uh, Gibson on his recent um, PhD. And he has done his PhD conducting an action-oriented green criminological study of the Trinidad and Tobago pet wildlife trade. He also holds a Master's of Arts in International Affairs from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, or SAIS. His past work experiences include advocacy campaigns, community-based governance reforms, and field investigations of sensitive topics with both international NGOs and small grassroots initiatives. So with no further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Mark Gibson. Thank you very much, Kirk. Let me see if I can get away with video, uh, but please keep me aware if you get any bad delays and I'll, I'll drop the video feed. Sure. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Dr. Douglas. Uh, thank you, uh, Janice, for your, your support. And uh, thank you to everyone uh, for, for having me today and, and let me, letting me speak a little bit on, uh, on topics that are of interest to me and that I think could be useful in a regional context within the Caribbean. So let me just go to my screen share. <clears throat> so the, the concept for this presentation is just has evolved some. Um, I'm actually in, in Barbados visiting and um, just really enjoying uh, learning about local wildlife management issues, trade issues. Um, and I've, I've been able to connect with, in addition to Kirk, um, uh, to other researchers. And so I've kind of crafted this presentation around that to be able to speak to some issues of method, um, some, some issues of civil society, political culture, and so on. So the the ultimate presentation that we're going to do today is a, a presentation that I hope at the simplest will be promoting more research on Caribbean wildlife trades. And uh, we're going to use this Nurture Nature campaign and the research project as a case study. So it's a little bit different. I'm, I, I'm going to give you an approach to wildlife uh, trade research. Uh, that is very specific to a paradigm, green criminology uh, with other um, novel components. Um, and it's something that uh, is very important to me as, as a longtime researcher and worker in international development. Um, and the, the simplest takeaway if you have today is green criminology could be a useful way for us to study wildlife trades. And it's gonna help us most of all, because it links different values and different harms. So it's a, uh, a meta paradigm in some respects. But let's, let's see if I can uh, convince you of that by the end of this presentation. So today, researching Caribbean wildlife trades, I'll talk you through the design, uh, how I, as a green criminologist and a project manager, designed, uh, in this case with my collaborators, the, the Pet Wildlife Trade Research Project. We'll, we'll give you some of the general principles of design. We'll talk through the case study and, and share some lessons learned at the end. All right, so Kirk, you already gave my introduction, so thank you very much. I'll just jump through. And for an overview today, um, here's a little bit more of an outline. I'm gonna speak for maybe 10 minutes or so on background, talk about what I mean by wildlife trade, uh, why it matters, uh, and a little overview, history of our project, and then I'm going to go right into uh, more of a methodological presentation, researching Caribbean wildlife trades. Background. Okay, so if I could aim for 10 minutes at best to talk someone through what do I mean by wildlife trades and researching them, um, this is as much as I, I think I can get to both an ex expert crowd and a general public audience. All right, so wildlife trades, Caribbean wildlife trades. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna take apart this term. So you see at the top, I'm gonna just start with the, the foundational concepts here. So of course, Caribbean, we all know the Caribbean, right? 
Um, I'm an outsider. And one thing that I find so interesting is that I've actually worked across the what we might call wider Caribbean. Um, but depending on where you are, where you are in the region, people will actually disagree on what is and is not Caribbean um, in, in some extent. And of course, we have the Caribbean basin, which is a very much a ge geographic identifier. But then you have cultural aspects. So Trinidad Tobago considers itself the southern Caribbean and thinks of itself as sharing a culture with uh, somewhat related to Guyana. Um, I've actually done a bit of work as well on Caribbean Nicaragua and there it's English speaking and blue fields and uh, the identity there is not Central American, it's Caribbean. Same thing on the coast of Honduras. So it's just to begin, Caribbean, what I mean by it is either the insular island-based Caribbean which is not a perfect geographic fit. Like I would include Bahamas in that, but of course Bahamas has no, nothing to do geographically with, with the Caribbean basin itself. Um, and then you would say beyond the insular Caribbean, you'd say the, the wider Caribbean, okay? And that, that would be all these adjoining, connecting, bordering countries. So Belize, Caribbean or wider Caribbean, little coastal Nicaragua, maybe wider Caribbean, we might call it. So we can think pretty expansively when we think about wildlife trades. Let's move on to wildlife, this, this idea. Uh, another fun term that is also very fuzzy, if you really get into it, if you look at your dictionary online, you'll see that it includes anything that's an undomesticated species. But if you look at everyday use, we're really talking most of the time about undomesticated animals. Uh, amphibians, birds, mammals, reptiles, and we kind of de-emphasize things like fish, insects, corals, uh, plants, fungi. You know, if, if someone said they went on a hike in the forest and I saw a bunch of wildlife, and they're like, what'd you see? And you're like, trees. They look at you funny. Um, and so there's kind of a disjuncture in how we use this term. So I, it's important in what you'll see we've done in our project is we've been very clear. We, we don't want to um, not show support or interest in other species, but for us, we're really looking at terrestrial undomesticated animal species. You also have some, some trickiness in this uh, use of the term undomesticated. And that's there's actually species that are fitting now a definition of um, semi-domesticated, uh, things like the American bison, which was brought back from extinction with selective breeding. Um, Eastern honeybee, for instance, in Asia is heavily used for honey cultivation, but it occurs in the wild as well. And you have many, many examples, and I'll, if you want, you can screenshot this or I'll, I'll send the, the deck over, but I won't read off everything here. Trades, what do we mean by this? Uh, it seems, again, very simple word, but so much possible confusion. So it's producing, exchanging, and using products, right? And in contemporary analysis, we focus on chains of action across geography. And in uh, sustainable uh, trade chain analysis, you actually see things like um, uh, full life cycle analysis, so disposal, use, and maintenance. When we look at wildlife trades, we see that there's a little bit of divergence and a little bit more of a narrowness in the research that we have today. So let's just go to wildlife trades. All right, so we would call wildlife trades the human activities necessary to produce, exchange, and use wildlife and their derivatives. So living animals and their products, wild meat, feathers, and so on. It, wildlife trades as a concept has only been around for about 100 years. Uh, it's a popular topic of research and policy. Wildlife trades, however, by contemporary definitions have been going on uh, since prehistory, okay? Um, historically, the research, we have ignored use and focused primarily on production and exchange, hunting, trade, like shipping, um, and you have very little research literature today on consumer use of wildlife. You also have life cycle uh, considerations that really aren't explored yet in wildlife trade research. Um, and another really kind of sad and sometimes depressing fact is that we have very poor data on this globally. Um, it's a little controversial. Do we, how, how much do we share on the limitations of data, right? 
we want to be able to convince um, and explain how things are an issue, but I find it's very important to admit to our, our weaknesses. So here's a very official report uh, from ICWIC, uh, which is a consortium of major uh, organizations, UNODC, uh, I believe UNEP, um, a World Customs Organization. And here's the analyst basically saying, we don't really have great data or measurements on wildlife trades and other types of crime. And that's still largely the case. But we, of course, have estimates. So according to our limited data, we would say wildlife trades can have uh, illegal wildlife trades, for instance, can have valuations somewhere between 50 and 220 billion, right? So you got different estimates here, legal logging, fishing, more other types of trade. Nick. They, they would say that it rivals, but is not as big as other illegal problems like drugs and human trafficking. You also have some other data that would say the legal wildlife trade, things like seafood industry and fashion and furniture and medicine is also just very, very large. So seafood alone can reach 200 billion or more, uh, fashion and feathers and uh, caiman skins and other things can also reach very large in the billions per year. So we don't have great data, but we do know that it's a very big industry. Uh, we seem to broadly agree on that. We also know, as we see here, that there's perceived and, and decent data enough to say that there's illegal issues, but because it's illegal, we don't have great data. All right, that's kind of the broad brush for wildlife trades. So let's bring this all together and consider what I mean by Caribbean wildlife trades. So this would be when we study wildlife trades, we are looking at human activities necessary to produce, exchange, and use wildlife and their derivatives across the insular and wider Caribbean. We don't have great data in the Caribbean. You can just see here a quote from UNEP uh, from 2018. We're really limited on the illegal stuff, and even the legal stuff is not very well developed for this region. But we do, of course, know, as uh, all of us consumers ourselves living or, or, or visiting the Caribbean, we know that we have plenty of seafood, timber, pet trade, wild meat, jewelry, art, and so on that rely on wild species. Okay, so when we say we're gonna research the wildlife trade, we mean this, right? Human activities, production, exchange, and use. All right, in this context, we know that there's also a lot of problems, right? So this is a very broad brush thing. As a green criminologist, you actually need to separate out your values. So I would advocate that this is something we all consider as well explicitly. Do we care about wildlife trades because we support animal welfare or, or animal rights, biodiversity conservation, culture, public health, rule of law, sustainable development? And you find that mostly in the literature, you see very harm-based conceptions. We talk a lot about the illegal wildlife trade, but not the wildlife trade. Uh, we tend to use other words when we're talking about the legal form. We also know it's heavily weighted towards biodiversity conservation. So there's some good articles, if anyone's interested, uh, essentially critiquing trade research for not talking about animal welfare, even though we know generally it's just devastating to animals. Same thing, rule of law. I mean, here's a wild one. We've got recent literature really pointing out that in spite of the focus on illegal wildlife trade, most of the time we have very little analysis to know what actual specific laws we're violating. So current uh, concerns for wildlife trade, we have a lot of values, some expressed more, and we have a lot of limitations in existing research and data, both regionally and globally. Yay, I know, it's, it's a great one. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, of course, we have all these concerns at play. Um, rule of law, grenades being traded with illegal monkeys. You can imagine that. Uh, we have activists calling wildlife trade animal torture. Uh, conservationists asking where songbirds have gone and on and on. And um, this articulation comes out in many different ways. Okay. There's actually most conservation organizations today would look at other things like cultural promotion or rule of law, but not maybe so much animal welfare unless it's specifically in their mission. All right. So let's just do one last background bit on 
nurture nature campaign and then i'll just jump into this this mini presentation an action oriented trade research project so this is what we've been working on at trinidad Tobago since 2018 uh, and it has been a very exciting ride uh, we are united today under the banner of nurture nature when we first started this was just called the trinidad and Tobago pet wildlife trade project great name um, we got initial funding from USA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife to be able to work with our initial partners of SII and uh, Crest, and then we expanded after about a year uh, and a half of coalition development, we expanded to have a, a project involving 13 NGOs supporting research, supporting action, and um, we are looking at uh, further expansions and, and possibly even some, some expansion of scope as well. All right, so Nurture Nature Campaign. The very basics on this, just a few slides. Our goal is to end the harmful pet wildlife trade. We do look at terrestrial and undomesticated and semi-domesticated wild animals. Uh, we look at pets and other animals enjoyed in captivity, uh, Trinidad-Tobago and trade-linked countries. And we have very specific values that we make sure are incorporated into our, our line of research. Cultural practices is a new one, but is one that has been recognized through coalition discussion that we can't just do this passively. We need to recognize that some things here are very culturally embedded. So that we're very proud of that continuing evolution in our, in our design. Foundational research, just a little timeline. So we've been going since 2018. Uh, we have done a number of uh, data collections and analyses. Uh, I did this as part of my PhD and I collaborate with a lot of really great people. Among uh, the, the minted PhDs, you have Nigel Noriega with SII, Bernadette Flair with Crest, Ryan Muhammad as an advisor of the campaign. And we've had about uh, 15 uh, master's re researchers and students uh, and graduates collaborate with us on research as well. And, and they're also, um, depending on the, the data collection, they are also co-authors. Um, we started off, as I mentioned, with Crest and SII. We worked through St. George's University and we got funding from USAID and US Fish and Wildlife. As part of that grant, we evolved to a coalition in 2019 and have 13 members. And we have a strategy that is based around improving knowledge fostering civil society collaboration, and changing behavior, also removing barriers. So we do want to reduce the harms of the trade. If it means ending the trade or parts of it, mitigating some of the issues, and this is an open-ended project. All right, just some pictures, because pictures really tell the story. What's going on here? So this is uh, our coalition back at our uh, first formative session, um, and we shortly thereafter signed our MOU as a group. Uh, this was pre-COVID, so in case you're wondering where the masks are. Um, we've done a lot of different activities, including tours. Uh, this is a game wardens learning about native wildlife and identification. Uh, we've been doing posters in different settings. So you see here a veterinarian showing their messaging materials. And we've done things like billboards um, and really reaching for broad markets. Okay. So there's some background. I know it's a little bit um, it, possibly getting into the nitty gritty, but this is kind of the, the basics of really talking about research in Caribbean wildlife trades. All right. So to, for this presentation, let's just talk about it. Um, this is really an argument and a presentation on research methodology. We don't have great data in the Caribbean. Uh, I will leave it to UNEP and other uh, very expert multilaterals to prove that we have an absence. It's a really challenging thing as, a, as an empiricist to, to, to show you don't have great data. Um, but in this case, it's pretty well agreed to from a, an expert and stakeholder perspective. So for us, we want to advance a research methodology with our project. Um, and we would love to see other organizations, uh, CBS, other NGOs in the region uh, also prosper and, and develop in, in how we collect data, how we share data. And so that's where we very much align with CBS's uh, wildlife project. So um, it's very nice to be here for that. So for definition, 
If I say research methodology, I mean a systematic approach and techniques to conduct research, gather data, analyze information. And we're going to talk about how we build that in a wildlife trade setting, and we're going to get the case study. Um, I talked through the purpose, uh, but essentially, if you follow this lecture and maybe some follow up, we can share training materials. Most anyone could probably build a very simple or small scale research project. Um, and we're also very happy to share our research instruments if people are interested. Okay, so let's talk about the three elements of our, our research methodology. We've got paradigms, frameworks, and methods. All right, uh, it's always risky when a presentation starts talking about paradigms, um, but the very basic is paradigms are as much communities as, as the scientific disciplines and tools that depend upon them. It's a term that's very modern. Paradigm emerged in the 60s and a little bit before that, thanks to Thomas Kuhn and his seminal work, um, uh, Scientific Revolutions. And contemporary thought around paradigms is not that one has to replace another, but you actually get more diversity. And if we think about paradigms and the study of wildlife trades, you have huge literatures. Animal welfare science looks at it, conservation biology, green criminology, legal studies and law, public health, One Health. Green criminology, uh, which we use, is in fact a, a pretty new phenomenon. So I'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. All right, so just some examples. What do I mean by paradigms? Am I just making this stuff up? Well, a great example would be the paradigm of conservation biology. You have the society for it. You have journals. This is just one of many. And there's a lot of frameworks and, and, and literatures united around this, this term, conservation biology. Um, fisheries management, which is often a, its kind of own discipline, it often considers what are its paradigms. Uh, for green criminology, IUCN now recognizes it as a distinct form of specialization. Um, so again, paradigm. Um, this Bennett et al. 2017 is uh, another way that uh, conservation biologists have tried to think of different paradigms they could draw on that could be useful to them. So again, paradigm. So if you're going to do research on wildlife trade, you have to figure out your paradigm or paradigms. And if you don't know, maybe talk to your advisor and, and figure out what you're working with. All right, frameworks. Frameworks is more of a project management concept that once you have your rough uh, philosophy and methods and tools, your kind of rough um, spirit of how you're going to approach your research, you wanna really think about practical considerations. And that's where we talk about frameworks. This is a perspective and a, and a term that may not be universal to academia, um, and maybe it's subsumed in the discussion of paradigms, but uh, what I would say is if you're working on wildlife, this is a very standard concept. Um, and what I would point out is that open standards for conservation is one of the most famous frameworks in conservation and wildlife trade management. And it's used to structure research and, and action all around the world. So frameworks. Um, there are a bunch of frameworks that you could use for a wildlife trade research project. Action research is a great one. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, it's in the title of my, my dissertation. Mixed methods as well was also fundamental to my research. Project management science, the, the, the basic uh, building blocks of projects, programs, tasks, activities how you plan over time, and then open standards for conservation. So you, once you figure out your paradigms, you also wanna figure out your framework or frameworks. Some examples of frameworks, usually you see them as diagrams. Most famous would be action research originating from um, an action-oriented research named Kurt Lewin. Um, and then you have things like in criminology, other versions of action research appearing. So this is actually a, a framework used for something called problem-oriented policing. So frameworks, if you're gonna do wildlife trade research and looking especially at legality or harms, it really helps to have a process, a framework. And then of course, methods, right? I think most of us on, on the call would know, uh, have heard of research methods. 
right? This is probably the most common and more publicly accessible thought around research methodology. Interviews, observations, surveys, uh, focus groups, if you're thinking social science. If you're looking at natural science, it could be any number of other methods. Um, observation often being important. You might be using uh, special measurements, uh, recording air temperature and so on. It depends what you're looking at. In the case of methods for wildlife trade, um, there is actually some decent research around this. Uh, originally started with Gavin et al. in 2010, where they identified eight popular research methods for illegal natural resource uh, management and, and associated research. Um, and here you just see kind of a description. And then you have factors to continue identif uh, factors to consider identified by Gavin et al. Basically, given your situation and what you're trying to do and your budgets, you can consider some issues like what's going to be most appropriate. Unfortunately, uh, methods, as much as the general concept is accessible, we find often that um, if you ask one researcher to, to build a set of methods and you ask another, you don't always get a lot of agreement. Um, so it is a little uh, messy and, and challenging to identify standard taxonomies, but at the very least, you can see things. Um, this is from Arius, where he attempted to, to combine uh, the, met the methodological taxonomy of Gavin, along with some other researchers. So you can think of wildlife trade research, you might engage in surveys, law enforcement records, direct observation, indirect observation, like looking at discarded gear, uh, remote sensing, and then forensic studies. But if you ask another researcher, they might call this completely incomplete, or you need to call, you know, separate this into two. It's, it, it's, it's a little challenging this way, but I find this Arius offering a really great um, uh, set of um, uh, methods for, for use. Another way to consider this is just get a really good methodological book. Um, and these are two that I found exceptionally useful in the last decade or more. Um, so if people are really thinking about wildlife trade research out there, these are, these are excellent. All right, so this is background. Let's go into the case study. All right, how have we pulled together paradigms, frameworks, and methods in TNT? So I'm mainly going to talk about design, which is not usually the sort of results you present for uh, wildlife trade research, right? Usually you're, you're showing what you've been able to learn from it. So we're going to have some of that at the end, but we're going to wrap it into a case study. And um, I'm going to finish by talking to you about lessons learned, things that are more general to consider when you're going to do research on the wildlife trade yourself or if you're advising someone. All right, so our case study, what have we learned in Trinidad and Tobago? How have we learned it more importantly? All right, well, to begin, again, I'll reiterate, our goal is to, is to end the harmful trade in pet wildlife in TNT. And this has come out as several objectives. So understanding the problem, understanding the possible solutions, and then problem solving, that iterative attempt to apply solutions to the problem. Uh, and it's everything, logistics, marketing, graphic design, whatever needs to be done. And so that's why over time we called this a campaign, a, a mission to change something. In association with our objectives, we have our research questions, right? So this is all pre-paradigm, pre-framework. Pre we to understand the problem, we've really considered it as an entire trade. Uh, to think about solutions more carefully, we also wanted to really look at users or wildlife keepers and understand their psychology. And then we really wanted to look deeply at the very specific solutions to modify uh, keeper psychology. Our scope, again, terrestrial animals, inclusive of semi-domesticated. And we did ultimately look at domesticated as well as an important alternative. And this is Trinidad and Tobago and trade like countries. Okay, paradigms. Finally, we get to talk green criminology. Um, a good definition of green criminology is that it is a specialized study of harms and crimes involving the environment and non-human life. 
There are many ways to conceptualize it because it's new and emerging. Um, you do get into some funny situations where green criminologists don't agree on who is a green criminologist. Um, and there are some interesting situations. I'll, I'll point those out on the, the following table. Uh, so there's disagreements of, is it a narrow definition? Is it a broad definition? Um, in our case, we did take a very standard approach to green criminology where you consider multiple values or harms. And we look at, in our project, animal welfare, biodiversity conservation, public health, and rule of law. That's been historically. And then as we move forward, we're looking much more carefully at cultural practice. So I'm going to show some images to, to hopefully give some life to these concepts. But I'll then add the other side of it is we did incorporate research methods, but it was much more on the framework side. Um, but mixed, mixed methods research is also considered another paradigm in itself. So you could think of this as a union rather than a hierarchy. But let's just look at what on earth is cr green criminological research or mixed methods research look like. So some visuals here. So green criminology, you can say, is very distinct from traditional criminology, which would look at only illegal acts. Green criminology is actually the study of harm and crime. So green criminology is both circles here. Um, so you might, as a green criminologist, look at things that are harmful, but not illegal. And that is a, a large part of what we've done in our own project. So we have data on animal welfare harms that are legal, right? Here are the paradigms and the, the variants of green criminology as pulled out by myself, uh, working with my committee. Um, some of these have been borrowed from um, a, a typology initially put forward by White. I should have had the citation on there, my apologies, but uh, Rob White is amazing and he's, he's really pioneered this universalist um, perception or, or, or understanding rather of green criminology. So for him and Rob White and those who support him, uh, you would see green criminology is including all of this. But you actually have some of these variants actually constructed in opposition to green criminology. So that's where some funny nets gets in. So if you've heard of the term conservation criminology, that is actually articulated as different and distinct from green criminology by like Gibbs in 2010. Um, and you have similar things, especially with... Uh, uh, Echo Global, no, sorry, that's white. Um, right, non specious criminology. There's some distinction if, if it is or is not green criminology as, as conceived. Um, but there's many variants. I would say that I work very much at the action oriented um, variant of green criminology. All right. Mixed methods, you look at mixing multiple methods. Simple as that, right? Typically, you would also look at quantitative and qualitative data, and that's what we did in our own project. Last one, frameworks. Open standards for conservation is the framework that we used. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, this is a um, framework for project building, research, other actions that is used and endorsed by USAID, major donors. Um, it was co-built by many of the most famous names in wildlife trade work, uh, TRAP, not traffic, sorry, WWF, WCS, and many other partners. Um, if anyone is, is interested, I highly recommend uh, you look this up online. Um, there's tremendous amount of resources. Uh, it's essentially a, an incredible project management tool that can take you from that parad paradigm and the theory to implementation on the ground. And I'll show an image of what that looks like. Mixed methods planning as well. Uh, you can draw on mixed methods as a framework itself and has some tools and notation available to you. So what is conservation standards? You would say you have projects and you have cycles. So a whole project might go through multiple cycles of this, but in general, you would initiate with assessment, move on to planning, implement, analyze and adapt and share. It's very simple stuff, but quite powerful when you're in a team-based approach. It also offers ways to conceive of your problems and your learning with uh, mental models or what it's called as situational models and theories of change. 
And in our case, I, I won't share our uh, situation model because there, there are some sensitive aspects of it, uh, but this is just an example of a situational model. And then we do have, of course, then results chains, the uh, action-oriented thinking about action, output, result. And that would be far, far more even uh, complicated at times when you build it out. But this is one of our strategies, which is based around research. So we reduce wildlife trade through better information and, and status and trends. We evaluated our needs. We got built in things like IRB approval, supporting dissertation approved and on, and then moving on to NGO based wildlife trade research and then running through multiple um, research methods. And of course, it's very sophisticated by the end of it, and is I'm surely a, a lot for the average uh, audience member. But this is probably what you need uh, for even a smaller and simpler project. You don't need to have um, all ten or so methods employed. But this is how you would present this for funding in a conservation standards approach. And this it was was one of our strategies that was funded. All right, mixed methods, the methodology, the framework, the notation, it's pretty simple. Um, it's nowhere near as sophisticated as, as open standards, but we did ultimately use that in conjunction. So we created our project using basically two different frameworks. And this is, again, it's rather sophisticated, but when you're running a really big project with a lot of different people and moving parts, it was actually really helpful to have everything in one place so we could look at it. So frameworks are, were tremendously useful. Let's talk about methods and then we can just start talking about some of the most interesting insights that we've got. So we did 10 or more methods, right? Again, depending on how you look at things. But uh, four of our methods in this project is a case study we found uh, to be uh, tremendously rewarding for ourselves as researchers and activists. Um, so I'll point those out. So we did a national household survey on animal keeping. This was randomized uh, across the entire country of Trinidad and Tobago, 2004 households. We had the support of Central Statistical Office. And this has been huge in helping us think about communities where there's high rates of wild animal keeping, um, thinking about national attitudes, finding out how uh, pet keeping relates to wild meat consumption, and you name it. We, we really got a lot of data from this national household survey. Another piece that we did was a key informant interview uh, component that became itself an, a database within qualitative software. We've done over 300 key informant interviews. Uh, this is not all of the, the the descriptors, but some of the most important ones, we have active traffickers, not that many, but eight is pretty good and it's been very, very in depth and we are remain in contact with many of them. Uh, we've interviewed pet shop operators and um, a lot of wild animal keepers with a lot of in-depth research and regulators, uh, Coast Guard, police and game wardens and, and so on. A third method that we found very, very useful, taxonomic inventory. Uh, we would call this a very new and emerging uh, method for wildlife trade for people to consider. Um, you would look at, if you use um, one that I'll show momentarily from Pasquale and colleagues, you could look at uh, as many as seven or eight fence categories and you can assign them uh, different laws and be able to basically map how something is legal or illegal within a country. Uh, and I'm gonna show some images of this in a moment. And then the final thing is, as you can see, we use a lot of uh, photos and we actually have a lot of videos in our social media work. Um, and that's been a huge part of our project is observations supported by photo and video, ethically shot, releases used when needed. Um, and we now have over 7,000 uh, videos and photos of uh, the TNT wildlife trade. All right, so some, some visuals. So this is just another way of looking at research methods we've done and how we use notation. So very consistent with mixed methods. Uh, this is a visual of our key informant database that we've built. Uh, so it's very much an insider look. You would index uh, different interviews across different concepts. 
just a, a, an image of our national survey that we did. And so we made it very um, user friendly. So we would have images where people could pick out um, animals that they have or that they've seen, depending on the question. And then this is from Pasquale. Uh, just, uh, I think this is an excellent uh, new method for wildlife trade uh, for people to consider since often the, the crimes aren't well understood. And I know, I know, Kirk, you guys are working a lot on um, pulling together all the laws of wildlife trade. So you're probably familiar with these, with Maria Pasquale's work and her colleagues with uh, Jacob Phelps as well. Um, but this is essentially a massive database that you could then create another imagine creating another column and so if you wanted to know what law makes it illegal to chase disturb or harass wild animals uh, and it does have an index code you would have in the next column essentially the clause and the um, law name and maybe another column with like the link um, so this is really useful and there's there's some other legal um, programs using this now like sustainable wildlife partnerships so um, taxonomic is fantastic for laws. All right, so to continue the case study is we've done a multi-method action-oriented project. What have we produced and what we are, what are we producing? Um, so um, I have, of course, my dissertation, which it was completed last year, and we're now moving to a number of manuscript submissions uh, with several already in. Um, we have briefing documents on our website, uh, like this trick overview, which we put in at, um, at CITES in November in Panama. Uh, we've done a host of webinars. We've got a lot of uh, use of even research materials and description for broader public and uh, everyday kind of language on our social media. And then because there's so many, there's so much data, uh, I'm just going to pull out some general results, and then I'm going to frame this for public health and other sort of harms. So bring this back to the, the, the mission of Center for Biosecurity Studies, thinking about public health. Okay, so broad descriptions on this, this is a case study. Uh, our results, if we wanna think about what we know now before, know now relative to before. Um, before we had very limited understanding of traded species. Um, a traded species guide, for instance, had been done, um, I think it was, several years before we initiated. It was an excellent guide, but um, it was thought to be pretty comprehensive and it had about 30 species on it. And since then, we've now identified over 203 terrestrial wild animals alone, and that's not including aquaria. Uh, we don't uh, provide estimates on aquaria just because um, it's, there are so many species and ideas so tricky. So we hope to have a little bit more comprehensive information there going forward. But just a wide diversity of animals and that we now have documented in, in video, in photo, in key informant discussions, in national surveys showing ownership, right? We've also learned a lot about volumes. Uh, pretty, pretty fascinating to think that you, by a conservative estimate, would have 230,000 uh, as much as 230,000 captive terrestrial animals and they have high mortality rates in captivity. So it means that you need quite a few animals to maintain that population year on year. Um, relative to the population trend of Ego with a million people, uh, 1.3 million people, this is an exceptionally high keeping rate. Um, in fact, we, we know that there's one in six homes in Trinidad and Tobago now keeps a captive wild animal. We also have some general insights with regards to regulation. Um, for the four years from 2017 to 2021, um, there's only a, a little over a thousand uh, illegally imported uh, wild animals and other specimens and, and, and so on. And then to sustain this population, which is almost all imported from Venezuela, um, basically CITES is not catching 99% of the trade is, is the insight. Uh, we know that there are some decent laws for the trade by our taxonomic analysis, but there's a lot of gaps and deficiencies in how they're implemented. All right. So some visuals here. We've mapped the wildlife trade in Trinidad Tobago, pet wildlife, 
coming in, uh, a lot of locations that we can index back to conversations with different informants. Uh, we've learned a lot about how the trade works, um, and even how uh, things come in like private jets at the Piarco airport are now widely alleged to bring in animals from, from other countries, for instance, uh, Brazil included. Um, this is a, just a visual of, of the percentage of households that would keep uh, captive wild animals in the country. So all wild animals, um, again, that's, that's a very high rate, um, but then birds consists, birds makes up almost all of the, the ownership. So when you ask people what's the most common animal traded, some people will say monkeys because it's very visual, right? That's it's like the image on the slide. Um, but actually, more often than not, it's birds. And um, the most commonly kept bird is, for instance, the orange-winged Amazon, found in about one in 10 homes. All right, and here's just an estimate of a mean estimate of the, the wild animal population. So looking at another way. Uh, so about 120,000 birds or more are captive right now. Okay, last bits. Let's talk about harms and then lessons learned on this journey to research a Caribbean wildlife trade. So Kirk, um, it, you and I have sh shared a lot of um, communications about zoonotic diseases and things that, that really concern us in the wildlife trade. Uh, and so it, here is our, our one, a primary focus on uh, public health for a few slides, because um, as, as you've really convinced me uh, over the last couple of years of, of our exchange is that uh, uh, this needs a lot more look. Uh, this is pretty concerning. Um, I myself had not ever really looked into zoonotic diseases um, within my career. So Hopefully we've got most of this right and, and intelligible for you, but um, uh, I, I, I look forward to your, your feedback on this. But um, in terms of the project then, what have we documented in terms of harms to public health and safety? So we can talk about qualitative and quantitative. A lot of it's qualitative, right? Um, but we do have a, a wild number of quotes from veterinarians to traffickers to wild animal keepers all saying their birds come in with lots of diseases. And they talk about things like coccidiosis, avian pox, avian mites, um, and then more serious things they're not really so sure about, but they do have concerning mortality events. We actually know really scary is a common practice among bird keepers is when you have a sick bird and you don't think you can uh, nurse it back to health, the preference would be to release it into the wild, which is just terrifying when you think about what, what that could do to wild populations. So here you've got, you know, participant 40 telling us, this I think is a songbird keeper. He's, he's saying people let, it, let the sick ones go. He's, he's even admitting that he's done it before, All right? Uh, crowding in cages and use of chicken crates is another massive uh, concern. I'll show you an image on that on the next slide. Uh, but with with uh, diseases picking up like avian influenza, issues with poultry, uh, like Newcastle disease, disease and more, this is kind of a just a, a ticking time bomb for zoonotic diseases in, in the wildlife trade. And then a last consideration really on diseases is that we, they are, when you have a wild animal in captivity, it's a long-term repository for zoonotic diseases. And uh, we have lots of observations, some photos, but we're not trying to embarrass anyone. Um, but there's definitely a lot of instances of rats and pigeons visibly mixing with a whole range of wild animals. Um, pigeons especially is concerning and, and as it relates to, you know, free flight. Um, and it's, it's pretty well known that a lot of wild animals don't maintain good health in captivity. So they're gonna have compromised immune systems. So some images, right? Here's just some animals and, and things that are at risk. Uh, I think avian flu would be misplaced for the macaw, uh, but I'll have to correct that, Kirk. Um, but you have leptospirosis and leprosy associated with tattoo or armadillo yellow fever, and we do have some documented cases of tuber tuberculosis exchanged in Trinidad with monkeys being kept. And here you have some chicken crates with, with uh, yellow-crowned Amazons being brought over. 
So there's some really concerning zoonotic disease risks. Physical harms, monkeys bite, especially when they become adults. Um, and more interestingly, we, we found that a lot of wild animal keepers could share on their emotional journey. And most have tremendous, um, uh, apologies for the typo in the slide, but uh, they, they, they just talk about tremendous loss and emotional struggle in owning a monkey, for instance, uh, which might be treated very much like a human baby for three or four years. Um, and then it'll become a uh, complete and utter problem and uh, might have to be kept in a cage and they don't know what to do with it. Um, I, I actually was part of an observation one day where a monkey got loose um, before I arrived and got off a chain and, and bit severely um, the neighbor's um, daughter and a very young girl who is then scarred afterwards. Um, and a lot of monkey keepers especially will, will share about these in incidences where they're like, if I had any clue what I was signing up for. So it's another dimension of, of public health and safety to consider. Loss of ecosystem services risk. So this is harder to, to demonstrate in a social science project, definitely. But there is evidence of um, if we lose ecosystem services that support economy, livelihoods, well-being, ecotourism, this could be another uh, damage to health. And some of the biggest uh, scares right now would be, Barbados is familiar with it, the ring-necked um, uh, in the hierarchy, uh, it, it's actually been found now in the wild in Trinidad, and we're hoping it's not breeding. It is known to be a crop pest in Barbados. And then uh, we have some traffickers now bringing in piranha, and they're being sold in a, in a country that is prone to flooding. Um, and that is, is likely to be a very damaging uh, fish if it were to get into the waterways and breed. So there's lots of risks in the TNT pet trade. We have to be honest in our research. One, one thing that we kept coming back to is that it, it is also from a public health perspective, there are no, it's not all bad. So we have to at least acknowledge this and find a way to work with these benefits that many people seek. In companion animals, you can find, well, companionship, right? Some care, uh, interspecies joy, uh, stress reduction. And then especially in songbird keepers, which is very social, they talk about the brotherhood and the socialization. So this is uh, not, a, not an actual harm, but it's benefits that we must weigh against. All right, other harms. I'm looking at my time. I want to make sure we're okay. This is just the tip of the iceberg is really the, the challenge uh, to convey here. But we know a lot of, also about other harms like animal welfare, biodiversity conservation, rule of law. Um, I can't talk through all these bullets. I won't do that to you, but I, I'll just say one of my most fascinating anecdotes as a green criminologist is that the most commonly kept animal in Trinidad, the orange winged Amazon, is actually illegal for seven months each year. That's how uh, an amendment ha uh, made it about six years ago. Um, and there's, there's nothing stipulated in the law to allow you to keep it. And so during closed season, it's illegal. During an open season, it's, it's legal. Um, and so a large segment of the population actually has a, officially a risk of a 10,000 TT dollar fine. Um, and so that, that's just one aspect. Is, is the law adequate if the most commonly kept animal isn't even managed by law? So there's, there's tons of examples we can give, but more importantly, I think I, is just considering the public health and, and the research aspects. So let's just take this to one last slide, lessons learned. All right, so if you were to do your own wildlife trade research project or uh, try to join one and contribute, um, one, we have a lot of research methods that we are happy to share here. They can be modified and implemented in other contexts. And we also found that there are some really great methods to use. So I'll just reiterate, use of photography and video for supporting observations has been so powerful for us. Uh, and that's just from a storytelling perspective, usually you don't have much of that data, uh, that, that visual. 
Uh, the use of key informant interviews, especially talking to people like veterinarians who know a lot and are very accessible, that's been really rewarding for us. Um, and then really looking at a national survey. It's expensive, but also gave us a, a fantastic baseline that could be measured against down the road to evaluate long-term impact. Another one is TNT pet wildlife trade. Just how are we going to tackle this? We've learned that it's a much larger than a single country. It needs to be addressed at regional and global scales. And wildlife trade, we believe the research on it must be expanded to assess multiple value dimensions. That if you're just talking about illegal wildlife trade and you're just concerned about conservation, it's not enough, right? Because uh, especially in our case, we find that the uh, almost always you have um, value agreement. So if it's illegal, it's often also damaging to the environment, threatening to public health, uh, and so on. And so it gives us a much more, I think, uh, a better toolkit uh, to, to use uh, to, to storytell and hopefully convince the public that this is a problem. Uh, and the very final lesson learned, and then you, you guys will be done, uh, is from a framework perspective, green criminology applied through open standards, it's really good, uh, but it's not enough. And with the scale and complexity that we were operating at, about a year and a half in, we did look at um, a consultant on our project to think about how do we better manage this. Uh, and a big thing that came out of that was using a project management software, and it really has changed how things work. So we use Asana. So there's more of a tool-based framework. Um, that's uh, You can Google Asana if you ever want to know, but it's fantastic. We also use time tracking and Clockify, so getting into the real world of like grant funding and and tracking resources. And we've also adopted, as the coalition has evolved, governance frameworks and communications. So this isn't necessarily what you need to do for your own project in this fourth lesson learned, but if you're going to be doing something open-ended and long-term, uh, highly recommend this, uh, you explore this at, at some point. All right, so there is our, our case study, lessons learned, a little bit about Caribbean wildlife trades. Um, with that, Kirk, I'll, I'll hand this back to you and I can, uh, I can leave it on this slide or I can, I can hand the, the share back to you. Well, thanks very much, Dr. Gibson. Um, I was very intrigued, riveted to my seat, just watching, um, the data that you put out, um, what stuck out to me was the, the, um, disparity in terms of the animals that are kept and it made me wonder and think about the psychosocial processes behind it and the way people are attracted to one particular animal it seems and the other if it's ease of uh, maintenance or if it is really a underlying kind of psychological um, bond or attraction to particular animals. And I know, for instance, Trinidad and Tobago, they have a lot of uh, snakes as well. Um, so um, reptiles, iguanas, um, there's always that threat of invasive alien species where these particular animals can escape the uh, care of their owners and then enter or even be intentionally released, as you mentioned, the sick birds, which is, yes, very disturbing as well. Um, so there's several different issues that we see, and I'm glad that you were able to kind of package this all together and still put it out in a very um, easily digestible um, way. So I know we have a number of questions in the question and answer section, so I want to give everyone their chance to get their question um, some light. So let's start with the first one in the question and answer box. This is from uh, Mrs. Wendy Lee. She said, in Jamaica, well, if criminals proudly broadcast their activities on social media, such as YouTube, I did not notice any mention of this in your observation section. And she goes on, the study of illegal wildlife trade here would be fraught with safety concerns. Yeah, yeah. Um, social media, uh, online presence, I didn't, I didn't get into that. Uh, that is another one of our methods in our, sorry, let me just 
Mm. All right. <laughs> um, well, social media, digital uh, displays of wildlife, it's very popular as well in Trinidad. It's global. Um, it is a huge problem. Um, it makes wildlife trade accessible to the average consumer. Um, and it's incredibly hard to get <clears throat> any of it removed. Um, it, even if it's a, if, if you as an expert, <clears throat> I've, been, I've been talking a little bit in the last couple of days. <clears throat> All right. Um, it's social media is everywhere and it's so frustrating that it, it's, you can go into a, uh, often an open Facebook group, maybe a closed Facebook group. There's definitely WhatsApp groups for people selling exotic animals. This is most countries now. And this is just the, the way things are evolving. And even these community groups, they get very sophisticated and you know, I, we regularly see groups now um, in different countries, including Trinidad, saying, OK, guys, from now on, you cannot say that this is for sale. No more of that. You cannot say this or that. And it's just because everyone's getting wise to it. Um, Meta, Instagram, Facebook, uh, other other platforms are starting to crack down on it a little bit more uh, or so we've heard. Um, but it's just so hard once it goes like closed group or on WhatsApp. We have done quite a few observations. Uh, we did a structured observation of uh, online sales for a five week period during a high season one year. Um, and it was just relentless and incredibly time consuming to track, um, especially just because of the terms of use of, of unfortunately meta. It's not as friendly to researchers. Uh, it's data. It's something that you could use like a web crawler to scrape and understand. But terms of use is no, no, no. You you cannot do automatic data collection on online on those platforms. So we we didn't go a whole lot deeper just because it was so time consuming. Um, but as a unstructured observation, uh, I and my entire community of researchers and uh, and people even beyond in, in other NGOs, everyone's in the groups and they're they're just keeping eyes on what's happening. Um, so there is some work being done on it, but it's it's tremendously challenging. Yeah, I would I would agree with you there. And I know in in terms of the case study in India, for instance, we've had I believe the wildlife arm of, of the Indian government. Yeah, they, they have actually used that to very good effect in terms of the web crawling. Um, so maybe it might be more of a national approach to, for instance, tackling invasive alien species as part of their um, national biosecurity um, system. I think that is something that they have to seriously consider because of the advent of the internet and also with you know electric or electronic payment systems. Now that those transactions don't have to come from like physical exchange of cash. This is something that facilitated all by digitization. And so well, um, well suited to that, you also have to allow your systems to evolve, to capture and adapt to the changing uh, evolution of, like you mentioned, green criminology, right? So I think that is a conversation that we definitely have to have. Um, and this actually leads into the second question from Mrs. Lee, Dr. Lee or Mrs. Lee, I'm not sure. Uh, does, T, does Trinidad and Tobago have the political will to address the problem of illegal wildlife trade? That's one of the challenges here in Jamaica. And I guess what she's really putting a finger on is how we perceive this type of trade and if it is the illegality surrounding it. Is it as bad as some of the other crimes? And this is one of the key issues that we're currently dealing with uh, when we look at the legislative review for the OECS and also for the Caribbean. Because if you take a judge right now and you put before him two cases, one with illegal wildlife trade and the other with narcotics, the attention is going to be turned to our narcotics and gun possession than it would be for illegal wildlife trade. Just because what is known about the illegal wildlife trade is you know, so small and so insignificant that obviously the weight would be given towards 
that type of um, crime. Um, so yeah. these are things we have to change if we really want to have um, some type of momentum where that is concerned. Yeah, it's the, the political will. And um, I've, I actually enjoyed um, coming here. I reached out to a, a number of uh, uh, researchers, lecturers, and uh, just, you know, as, as the fun goes for us academics, we get to read some of each other's papers and go, oh, that's, you know, that's really interesting. And uh, I, I enjoyed work by uh, Dr. Christina Hines. And um, if I recall correctly, I think he is emeritus, uh, Pearson um, uh, Broom, right, right, yes. Dr. Pearson Broom. And, and two great researchers. And um, I, I found in there some explanation of why things are, are, are hard and hard to change and also why I think we're seeing some progress for Trinidad and Tobago. So uh, Christina had some great work looking at civil society development. Um, part of our research project, look, it isn't the easiest way to do research when you have a large coalition, if, you're, if your endeavor is just research, right? That's, don't, don't do that, just, just do one NGO, that's all you need, if, if that's it. But the learning that comes along with it, where we regularly meet, we can talk about preliminary results. I mean, they're getting, uh, my, my dog and cat groups are getting data on how many wild, uh, how many dogs and cats are kept and their veterinary and spay usage rates and all this. And they're able to use this for their, their proposals. And then that also means they're much more vested and supportive of the project. Uh, conservation groups get their hands on a lot of insights and data that they can use when they meet and they make their advocacy. Um, so it has, I think, shifted the the, um, the 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 environment and the dialogue within civil society in the last several years. Um, we we by far didn't start the conversation on wildlife trade, and there's so many excellent NGOs and projects that came before. But in terms of the civil society development, this is new and the conversations that are had, uh, the joint learning, um, you know, I, we did a standing meeting yesterday and I was able to do a poll and uh, some of our insights and I could, I was able to actually catch a couple where I was like, oh no, I, I haven't, I haven't like shared this properly. No, 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 it's more animals. It's a lot more animals that are kept, right? So. But then other things is NGOs are really aware on like prevalence rates now and harms and it can speak to examples when they do press. Um, so that's that's how we conceptualize this as a, as a coalition. So Dr. Hines spot on, we, we need civil society and we have to find ways to develop it. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Broom is great and he, and he really talks about political culture and I, I enjoyed his book talking about ethics and how ethics are very important for the political process. And I, I think a, one way that we can try and put that discussion of ethics around wildlife trade into that political process is by talking about it ourselves. That um, so often, I don't know if you found this yourself, Kirk, but you know, we here's wildlife trade research. And then you like look through it and you look through it and you're like, okay, you all say there's zoonotic issues. But what? Like describe it. Where's the where's the list of diseases? Where's the and and then you realize this is really just about biodiversity, um, animal welfare, right? That is going to be probably some of your most compelling material within a public space uh, to to push policy. But then uh, there's some good papers that just say wildlife trade, animal welfare is largely absent from that discussion. Um, so, you know, the, the common understanding is it's hugely devastating, high mortality, but then it's only a handful of, of materials that you can really point to and say, well, that, that proves it, you know, here's the trafficker saying 80% die, um, or worse, but you don't have a lot of that data. So by engaging with these multiple values, we get really good data. And then we also just bring it up to the, to the policymakers and we can say, pick your reason why we should work on this, right? Because um, a lot of the solutions will, will have overlap. So. Yeah, that's, that's very, very true. Um, I, in terms of these zoonotic diseases, I, am, I noted that with especially monkey bites of the person that you showed, 
I know rabies is a concern in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's rare, but it is still possible for persons to contract rabies from a bite from an infected monkey. So that is also another zoonotic concern that should be should be um, you know highlighted and and disseminated throughout throughout not only Trinidad and Tobago but I think throughout the country. And I think when you mentioned regarding the evidence of zoonotic transmissions from wildlife in whether it be the pet trade or illegal trade, it begs the question, if that is really such a large focus or even a large issue, as it relates to the current regulatory system with CITES and even testing animals to, to come into a country, if it is a wild animal, what are the battery of tests that are necessary to kind of deem this animal fit for importation? Yeah. That, that is to me a big, large issue that is missing. And this is not a, a, a slight to the Caribbean. This is globally. This is the global system where we don't have that. And I think as part of pandemic preparedness globally, that is an issue that we have to address and address rapidly because when you look at the, the emergence of monkeypox, monkeypox is really a disease that was introduced to new regions through wildlife trade and not the illegal form, the very legal form. In 2003, you had the importation of monkeypox um, through a legal wildlife trader and distributor in the USA. And that's how monkeypox first emerged in the US. So these are constantly um, re-emerging issues, but we have to look at the systemic solution to it and not only the piece by piece um, approach that we, we have. But I know we have several other questions and I really want to give everyone their chance to get well, there. I got to respond to one point there. I, I think it's really great, which is we need a, more of a database, a, a repository of uh, zoonotic diseases that could be associated with different species or taxa uh, and quarantine and importation, definitely. And then also from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, we in well, Trinidad, there's a lot of species that are native that are um, confiscated. And how do we know when it's safe to release them into the wild, right? Um, so thinking about what do we actually need to test for versus what we need to just have them under specific observation. It's the same deal is uh, if it's global or international or it's local. But we if we don't know those things that we're just kind of we're just gambling in terms of releasing um, wildlife that's been confiscated. Um, and, and so what actually you end up seeing happen is a lot of these animals which are living, viable, healthy um, in wildlife trade management, a lot of animals are euthanized. Uh, so if we can get the zoonotic piece figured out a little bit more, you could improve environmental conservation and, and animal welfare. Yeah, very true. I have a question here from Regina Thomas. Spoke about wildlife trading, trading sorry, in Trinidad and Tobago. What about Barbados as it relates to illegal trading and the challenges wildlife face on the island? So this is now speaking of the Barbados context. Right, well, there's, so our, our primary research site is Trinidad and Tobago. Um, some of our active traffickers are uh, quite open about their source countries and destinations. Uh, there, it, there are linkages between Trinidad and, and Barbados, uh, mainly the illegal stuff being sent over to Barbados. Um, you know, I, I know there are some, locally some excellent breeders, uh, so I don't want to be like too hard on some local industry. But the, the dirty truth is a lot of those breeding stock animals probably would have been brought in illegally, at least initially. Um, but it, there's no legal alternative in, in many cases. Um, what, I do, what I do observe as a visitor playing tourist, playing kind of pet detective, you, you can call it what, what, what you will, but you know, I've gone around to some, some zoological parks in Barbados and, and there are quite there are some really good ones. There are some other ones I might kind of, you know, let's we might have a conversation, it, you know, share some perspective. But that you know, nothing too hard. I, I would say compared to Trinidad and Tobago, um, night and day, 
uh, Trinidad is is really wild. Uh, so uh, one of my one of my all time favorite uh, as a criminologist, I, I say this. My my favorite headline is you know um, traffickers caught with hand grenades and monkeys, and it just it it shows how the boats fill up and link with all these other really terrible trades. Uh, but then it just it's just the insanity of it all. You know, you you probably should not be trading in monkeys and hand grenades on, in in a contained space, right? Um, I don't I don't observe that yet in Trinidad in Barbados, but I'm I'm of course not not a a, a formal researcher here. Just just kind of looking around and and seeing what what I can notice and what people can share. Um, I think that the bigger issues are, are probably things like invasive management. Um, Ringnecks um, and and green monkeys. You know, there's a lot of ethical considerations and challenges around managing monkey populations. But I, I did notice that just a lot of Asians that I interact with, there's a lot of frustration. They can't home garden. Uh, cost of living is up. Wouldn't this be a great way to reduce the, the you know the household uh, cost and no, you if you grow and you don't have like a, a fully enclosed like reverse animal enclosure. Um, you might just come out one day and your whole garden is dug up. So um, it, it seems that those are some of the more inv invasive animal issues that are much harder here in, in Barbados that I've observed. Yeah, if we're speaking to the human well, the conflict that we are actually observing in Barbados. Uh, we have a question also from Abigail Adia. Apart from the recent legislature, are there any new upcoming legislature to stop the trade in terms of the legal movement of animals themselves to Trinidad from Latin America? And I would assume this might be the movement from Venezuela to, to Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, legal reforms are really tough and they take often years to develop and execute and especially execute well. So we want to see that, but we're not rushing the process uh, in Trinidad as speaking from the coalition perspective, uh, but there are definitely the law could be improved upon uh, and other associated wildlife laws could be improved upon. Uh, Trinidad still needing to pass um, a fishery, a new fisheries act, uh, a court, it apparently has the oldest fisheries management act in the world. Um, and so it has a lot of catching up to do in that regard. Um, I think we have decent enough laws for, for terrestrial wildlife in Trinidad. It just needs to be enforced. Um, of course, there'll move room for improvement. Um, we are, I, I think more encouraging is thinking about the intergovernmental cooperation in the region. And there are some interests for that. Um, really in the last five to 10 years, for instance, you've seen multiple uh, countries form initiatives to establish what's called a, uh, a wildlife enforcement network. Uh, and in Caribbean, they would call it a Carib WEN, wildlife enforcement network. Um, that's been discussed for a long time uh, by countries and multilaterals in the region. Uh, that's something that exists in most regions of the world and is a way to, to take multilateral funding and direct it to meet common needs in different countries. That is gaining some life. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say as, as an observer, when I was in CITES uh, at the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, uh, that was a hot topic is how maybe this could be formed or developed further. Um, our hopes are there right now for regional cooperation and, and trying to reduce some of that country to country trade. Well, we have uh, some questions also in the chat. Uh, one from Orion Goodman. What species or animal categories from Venezuela? He said he missed um, which species and animal categories come over from Venezuela. Most, most animals in Trinidad are from Venezuela. Even the animals you can get locally, it is cheaper now to bring in from Venezuela. Um, and I, I think one of the more powerful statistics I can, I can say about that is, um, you know, Trinidad is considered a high income developing country. And Venezuela across the border is, of course, we know has some, some serious challenges economically and has now 80% estimated extreme poverty. Uh, so you have this economic differential um, 
and 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 I mean, just to add on the, the the facts here, which is the areas of Venezuela that border Trinidad, um, and it's only a thirty minute speedboat ride, right, between the two places. Those areas, though, are historically also the most poor uh, and are, are are sparsely populated, but have indigenous. Uh, a lot of wildlife is is purchased from them through barter, things like flour and medicines. Uh, for very small payments of U.S. cash. Um, so you just have tremendous supply. So most are brought from Venezuela. Luxury keepers do bring in from anywhere. Uh, so uh, one of my favorite informants, sometimes I meet with him. He's a retired trafficker. Um, and, but we've had conversations where we'll, we'll play, you know, what could you get me? Um, and it's a very interesting conversation is because it, it we just talk through it and he thinks about, you know, using his old business mindset and, you know, you want a tiger? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done that before. I've sourced a tiger. You want a lemur? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do, you know, lemurs easy. Which, which type? Um, and so it's, you, it's a global supply chain. If you have enough money, you will possibly be able to get it. Um, and even things like hyacinth macaws, if you pay enough money, you will get people to FedEx or DHL uh, hyacinth macaw eggs from Brazil. And if you get it within a one a one day, you know, shipment, it's it's possibly still via, viable. And they just allow a certain amount of losses. So you get a, a very distributed network, but most of it's what's available and what's brought to sort of retail and consumers from a, from the supply side. Very interesting. We have another of a statement first and a question from Damien White. We have the ringneck parakeets breeding in Jamaica. Some of the roosting flocks have reached 800. Well, the public like pretty birds, again. And we are trying to come up with strategies to deal with the problem. Any recommendations? Oh man, this is where I usually uh, plead that I'm a social scientist uh, and invasives is, is, is also a new area like, like public health and zoonotics. Um, I, I don't know if there are great answers when it comes to um, invasives and human wildlife conflict. This is definitely one of those times where you have serious value conflict. So as a strict conservationist, um, you might point to case studies of Galapagos Islands where they've, you know, used lethal means to remove invasive goats and, and rats and other things, which makes sense if it's a World Heritage Site with critically endangered species. But even then, it's not hard for, it, it's not very easy for members of the public to accept, right? And then if you're dealing with, you know, a, a, a just a country, right? And um, now you're talking mortality and lethal means, it's very tricky. Um, you have a lot of strong feelings. We have other examples of this in Trinidad where um, like a community group in Trinidad has set up a cat sanctuary inside the Karani Swamp bird sanctuary. Yeah, let that one sink in, a cat sanctuary and a bird sanctuary. But it is such a hot topic Nothing can be done about those cats if it involves lethal means. The cats, what are you going to do with them? Put them in a permanent, I mean, there's 400 cats or more. Um, so we don't have good answers. I, if, if someone comes up with a, a great solution to that, other than just a very expensive solution, I would love to hear it. But it's, it's kind of the way of the world now. We have to figure out how to manage invasives and, and, and navigate these value conflicts. Yeah, I think, I think. Once the the animal is in the, the invasive is out there, then I mean we, we have like the lionfish. There's the lethal means of trying to reduce that. So we have some precedents that have been set, but you're quite right in terms of the the society and the the way they view um, any actions towards that would then shape how it is nationally accepted. So the norms of society coming back to the point that Dr. Heinz had made in terms of you know the whole civil society movement and being to educate them to sensitize them so that they fully understand all of the issues 
and they're not just solely acting on pure emotion. Um, yeah. Because if you look at a ringneck parakeet, it's a beautiful bird. And to see those birds just um, killed would, would definitely upset some persons. Um, yeah. The other question here, a rather statement by, I believe this might be Dr. John Bothwell. Parakeets are another challenge. This is in the Cayman Islands. Um, oh, he said parakeets. Other challenge is we spent years teaching the public to love endangered parrots in the wild. And we still have a ways to go. And now any green parrot, people assume, is a good thing, showing a healthy environment or species population. So we have to separate local parrots from alien species like mount parakeets and yellow nape Amazons. Point certainly taken. So we have a comment here from Damien White. He's saying, we also have problems where species were illegally brought into the country. For example, the yellow nape parrot. The species was bred and bought by a pet owner who is not aware of the laws. There is now a problem with CITES when that owner wants to move it out of the country and CITES asks for records for the animal. The owner can't get that information, so the bird is left back in the country and the conservationist gets the bad name. I guess these are all issues that we are starting to see um, coming yeah. forward. This yeah. is probably the last one that I'm going to, yeah, this is the last one here. Many exotic species, birds, reptiles, and monkeys have been found along with drugs, guns, being smuggled into the country. When the media highlights the traffic items, they typically do not mention the wildlife. So there's a disconnect for most people with how well of smuggling is intertwined with the illicit trade of narcotics and also with guns as well. That's a very important. Um, yeah, that in, in the, the green criminology, really just even standard criminology, we call this crime convergence. Um, and it, it's actually an interesting one uh, to consider that if, you know, Kirk, you, you mentioned earlier is how, how do we appeal to a government that cares more, more about violent crime than wildlife crime? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would say we don't necessarily need to, I don't think we want to even argue that one is more important than the other. I think it's kind of obvious. I, I'm, I'm, I, I think we should shut down violent crime as a priority, right? Um, but what is so interesting is the overlap between wildlife trade. And when you have parrots, when you have large animals, things that make sounds, macaws are one of the noisiest pets you can own. Um, What's funny is you begin to actually be able to easily access people who are likely to have other illegal contraband associations, especially if they're like high profile animals. So looking for people who like to keep like wildcats, jaguars, ocelots and so on, man, that is so popular with, with like gang members and others. It's, it's, it's just like a flex, right? Um, so, you can find that that is not hard to figure out who has a jaguar in, in most villages. That as an investigative method could be very useful. Um, if, if you're looking to reduce trafficking, go after these high visible signs of it. Um, and yeah, in Trinidad, uh, wildlife mixes with human trafficking, unfortunately, um, like sex trade, uh, you've got ammunitions, arms, um, but also illegal agriculture, wild meat. Uh, so if you go after the more visible animals that can't be, you know, put in a trash bag and hidden under a bed or something, you know, this is this is a great way to start disrupting some of the contraband networks. Yep. You know that you mentioned the the visibility of it. There's a question. Last question that we'll take. How can we be better monitor and control the trade? and smuggling of small reptiles and endemic insects. And I can bring to mind the uh, case of the, I'm trying to remember, it's the Union Island gecko. Yes, that small reptile that was um, smuggled out of the grenadines. Um, I think an 80% reduction in the population size over the course of a few years. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we have to have a systemic upgrade systems-wide across the region and also nationally 
to be able to one have the legislation but also the frameworks where we can monitor because what gets monitored or measured gets managed properly if you don't have the measurements the, the monitoring um, the effective ways of monitoring then we will always struggle and then always be two or three steps behind and that's why I, I think the incorporation of the digital approach to criminology um, green criminology is so exciting because it actually allows you know artificial intelligence machine learning to do the heavy lifting where then you can use the insights to really then put forward your uh, prep, your your, your uh, relevant strategy. So yeah. I don't know what you're. Yeah. Well, and I'll I'll just respond to that that point on what we can do better for uh, small reptiles, endemic insects. Um, so yeah, what gets measured gets managed, right on. But then there's not a mandate to measure everything. So you have some aspects. I would even broaden this for many taxa. But you have a lot of high volume significant trade in the region that's never been put to CITES, for instance, that it would say at least this should be a, an appendix two, meaning we aren't control, we aren't stopping it, but we're just measuring and carefully getting a, a handle on it. So CITES two listings for this region, let's, let's do more of those. And um, uh, one thing that really popped out with our uh, legal inventory is that some countries in the region legally have no coverage for certain species. And so insects and uh, amphibians are not even considered wildlife under uh, like Trinidad law. So there's legally, you can't even control it, even if it was listed under CITES because they don't have an implementing law. So some of the laws need to be implemented as much as the international uh, treaties and, and measures that, that are there. So um, more legal development. Oh, yeah. And thank you all for joining us for this very, very intriguing webinar. I think the the topic is very exciting um, and it, it, it leaves room for obviously, you know, improvement, development. But I think this is good that you are able to ventilate, articulate some of the issues, the multifaceted um, issues surrounding uh, wildlife trade and hopefully this will now start to build that momentum that is necessary so that it gains the um, level of prominence, the level of visibility that would then um, initiate action, like as you said, in your action-based uh, type of research. So thanks very much to all of you who joined us. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to share with you very, very briefly and quickly some of the upcoming events from um, That we have planned for this month at CBS. Just give me one second. So this is the next webinar that we have coming up. Um, this is at the end of the month on the 29th of March at 1 p.m. We will have the third part or part three of our climate change and sustainability development series designing for a new Caribbean climate. And we will have four very exciting uh, presenters, Professor Michelle Michael from uh, UE St. Augustine. She'll be looking at urban planning and climate change in the Caribbean. We'll have Miss Alyssa Amor Gibbons. She's the archi architeer uh, from Studio Amor here in Barbados. So she'll be looking at climate change and neo-Caribbean architecture. We also have Miss Heather Pinnock the Managing Director of Lucia Caribbean in Jamaica. She'll be looking at climate risk and property risk management. And we'll also have, um, finally, Mr. Randy Graham. He's the CEO of CG United Insurance Limited, our former uh, Massey Insurance. He will be looking at climate risk and insurance in the Caribbean. And this is all under the context of, Caribbean, of climate change in the Caribbean. How can we design more sustainable structures, infrastructure, not only homes and buildings, but roads, et cetera. Um, and then also the liability that comes along with uh, owning these structures. And we will have this at the end of the month. So stay tuned for that. And finally, 
we have our quarterly newsletter. And for those out there who um, are so inclined, we want to encourage you to submit your articles. We are winding down now because the month is soon at its end. So I encourage you to get in your articles. It will have to be very long, 500 to 800 words in length. If you have more, that's okay. You can email them to us and we can um, tell you if we will uh, publish the, the longer version of it, um, but definitely send them in and you can have your, your uh, article featured in our upcoming issue, which is probably going to be released at the end of this month. So if you haven't, if you have it there sitting, add your finishing touches, send them over to us. You can send it to by security at cavehill.uwi.edu. And uh, we'll be more than happy to have them. So, Dr. Gibson, you've been doing some extremely exciting and extremely beneficial research over there in Trinidad and Tobago. I, as you said, from I think 2000 or 2001, when we were first introduced and we first met, um, I always admired your your passion for your research and um, the team that you have over there too at Nurture Nature. Um, I really want to applaud you guys and I want to encourage you to continue the good fight. This is something that the region desperately needs. Um, so don't be phased, but continue to you know, stick to your guns and continue to do the excellent work that you've been doing. Uh, so on behalf of CBS, um, also UWA, I also want to thank the team at SITS Mr. Samuel Eugene and his team, also the team at Marcom um, over there. Thank you for the distribution of the graphic and also the information for this particular webinar. And for all of you participants, those who were able to register, some of you who may not have been able to view it real time, we will have a recording. So we will have that um, available to you very soon. Um, so no fears, uh, but all those who were able to join us this afternoon. I really want to thank you for continuing to support CBS and support our Caribbean region as we continue to try to preserve lives and livelihoods in the Caribbean through the lens of biosecurity. And I bid you all a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers, you too. Cheers, Cheers all. Bye-bye.